what's 5 plus 3? Okay. What's 4 and 9? This is difficult. What's 4 and 9? <laughs> okay, so people are awake. So since we have only 30 minutes, I just checked with them. They said, yes, we are going to switch off the projector. So I shall speed up a bit. But if anybody wants to take something offline, more than happy after this. Um, so this is going to be an exploratory session on um, how we can do user research a little differently in a world that's we are becoming more mobile, more connected, uh, more and more bite-sized. So this is going to be an exploratory session from my experiences, from something that I've learned uh, others are doing as well. And anybody knows why this, what the sushi is doing there? Nobody is feeling hungry. The sushi is mobile. You can take it wherever you go. It's literally bite-sized. And if you look at how popular sushi bars are becoming all over the world, I thought that was a perfect visual representation of a connected world. You know? So that's the reason the sushi is there. Um, okay, so this is the topic. I, if everybody, I'm sure everybody knows this was the topic for this year's UX India, which is driving value through customer experience. When I read this, the first thing that came to my mind was, is a customer the same as the user? For whoever's attended Prati's session and the Q&A, this would be a repetition that somebody asked, is the customer and the user the same, right? So consider this example. I buy a gift for my friend. Who's the customer? Who's the user? I'm the customer. My friend is the user. I buy diapers for my son. Obviously, he's the user, right? And I'm the customer. So then, if we're talking of driving value, then value for whom? Is it value for the customer or is it value for the user? Right? The reason I'm asking this is, I've seen a uh, lot of people use customer and user interchangeably nowadays, right? And largely for convenience because we use the two interchangeably. But I've found people at both ends of the spectrum, I've found in my work experience, I've found people saying, oh, you know what? I've asked my customer. They've told me exactly what they want. Why the hell should I talk to my user? Right? And at the other end of the spectrum, I found people who do lots of user research, make awesome products which are like perfect for the user. The problem is they totally ignore the customer. So that's why I find a lot of well-designed pro products remaining unsold because the customer is not taken care of. You might have designed a game which is awesome for my child. Uh, I have one and a half year old son, okay, so if I just start giving too many child examples, please <laughs> bear with me. So. Uh, so if you make an awesome toy for my child, you know, who's a user, but if the, the toy takes like three hours to set up, I don't want it, right? So that's why, um, long explanation for a short answer, love thy users, but love thy customers too, right? Value for both users as well as value for customers. It's a tightrope work, I know it's easy to stand here and say that but it's really difficult when we start doing it but I think as user researchers or as UX professionals I think it's our job to find that sweet spot right which is what is value for the customer and what is for the user and to find that sweet spot that's our job so for today's session I'm going to talk about only users but uh, it same thing applies to the customers as well because I talking of user research and you know uh, value for user but the same thing applies to the customers as well so if you look at the kind of things that we do in our job every day as ux professionals as product owners as uh, entrepreneurs who own startups you can pretty much put everything into four buckets right either we are discovering what is value for our users right finding out what is that need what do they want what do they really care for what are their aspirations after we discover that value, it's our job to communicate it back. Right? You come back and you tell your team, you know, this is what I found on the field. Right? That's the communicating part of it. Then you sit with them and together you create something. You create a product, you create a service, you create a, a company as well. Right? So that's a creation part of it. And finally, you assess. You go back and check if what you actually made is really of value to the user or the customer. Right? So when I, so this is what I call the value wheel, uh, just you know, just some clarity in my mind. Uh, so when I talk of, okay, so if you look at the um, traditional divisions, right, of evaluative user research, uh, don't think too much about it, but there is generative user research and there is evaluative user research. So this part of it is pretty much generative and this part of it is called as evaluative. Not too much to worry about. But when I talk of how user research can be changed, um, I'm going to talk of some major shifts which are happening in the world these days and I'm going to talk in terms of how we can bring about some change, how we can leverage those 
shifts which are happening in these four buckets. Okay, so far? Follow me. Am I too fast when I'm speaking? Okay, good. Okay, so let's start with discovering value. <clears throat> How do we discover value? How do we do user research most of the times? Anybody? You go on site, okay? See the user in their own environment, which is what pretty much is happening here. Interviews? Talk to them about their daily lives, qualitative, quantitative. But if you look at how we're still doing user research, no, we're doing still large formats. Right? You say, can I have half an hour of your time? I've done that to so many times. Can I have one hour of your time? And they say, one hour, I'm not going to give you one hour. And I say, okay, fine, 15 minutes, you know, and I try and hope that I can extend it. But I'm pretty much still doing large format interviews, right? But look at how people are shifting in terms of how they communicate. This is the major, first major shift that I've found. Anybody remembers this? Archie, Betty, Veronica, everybody's grown up on those. Remember these, Betty would come back, uh, uh, Veronica would come back from a vacation, some exotic vacation and sit on the couch and chat for hours with Betty, right? That's how people were talking earlier. Our communication was long, but it was spaced out, right? When I was in the hostel, I used to call my parents every three days because we were on the mobiles, there was landline, you had to go, dial it, and that's how communication was. Versus, look at how it is right now. When I go shopping, if I see a nice dress, I try it on, I click a picture, send it to my sister and say, what do you think? She says, great, buy it. That's it. Done. Right? So it's short, but it's always connected. When I go home, I try it again and send her a picture and say, what do you think in the evening light? How does it look? Right? So we are always connected, but we're doing short bursts of communication. Right? The other shift that's happening is everyone's moving. Everything's moving. I, I don't need to state this again. Everybody knows the world is on wheels. Right? I've done usability tests for like blogging. Uh, platforms and all, right? Where you get people into the usability lab, give them a computer, they'll start a blog and say, how do you type a blog, publish a blog? Look at how people are writing right now. You start typing on your computer, you continue typing on your maybe iPhone when you are in an office shuttle and when you go home, take your iPad and post it, right? So there are three different devices, three different locations. So everything's moving, everyone's moving. That's the second shift. Now, how can we use this tool to change the way we do user research? to discover value, right? I think the mobile, this is a highly untapped area. Why can't the mobile be used as a tool, right? People take photographs, people take thousands of selfies. Why can't we use mobile phone to actually understand a little better about the environment? This is an example I found somebody's uh, done this. I, this was more for market research than user research. But what it does is it says, take a picture, you know, describe your mood, uh, or what are you doing right now? So they're, what they're doing is actually they're blending user research, keeping it short and crisp and blending it what what people normally do, right? They're not asking somebody to come to a lab, but they're saying, you know what, you take tens of selfies, why don't you just take a photo of what your house looks like and send it to me? And that's one way that somebody solved it. I'll give you an example. Uh, we were doing um, a diary study. Uh, um, for uh, when I was working in my earlier company. You know what diary studies are? You give people a diary and we had given them an internet device and they had to every day make a note of what all they have done on that device. Okay? What we found is nobody writes anything and typically Indian habit, I would say not even Indian, global habit of last minute preparations like how we do for exams, just before we would go visiting them, they would quickly scribble something in the diary. So how we did, how we tried to uh, overcome the problem is we would call them every day. Just a five minute call and say, hey, what are you doing? What did you do today? Did you use the device? Acha, kya kya kiya? Can you just tell me? Now that five minute call was very low investment. Na, hai, I can talk to these guys for five minutes, tell them something. And that became our primary source of information. We knew whatever was in the diary is going to be some last minute cooked up story. But we gave them the diary nevertheless, but we relied more on these five minute calls, right? And you know how, how often, just before I got here, I was checking, I got a WhatsApp notification, I was checking who sent a message. Even if it's a forward message, we are addicted to it. So imagine if you use WhatsApp, for running user studies. It's, it's, it, I mean, we just need to make that shift. It's possible, might be a little difficult to start with, but I think just moving from that mode of long format to short formats. Yo, I don't know if you guys heard about Yo. There was that ridiculously useless, people thought that, you know, what is it, you can only send a Yo. 
but there are people who study uh, for example tv watching patterns right you want to understand how people watch tv in a day if you tell them every time you start watching tv send me a yo every time you stop watching tv send me a yo right and just by that simple act of sending a yo you can get a timeline of how people are actually watching tv right simple tool um oops i'm back yeah has me seen this it's a small camera it's a small camera called narrative clip all it does it takes i think two pictures per minute and then uploads them uh, onto a cloud right so you don't have to go clicking camera uh, clicking pictures it takes pictures so if you are doing like a day in a life study i have done it with doctors and i found very difficult because you don't get access if they are with the patient you are not supposed to sit there and watch imagine if you give them this and say all it's going to do is take pictures you get to finally veto if you don't want a certain picture and we don't put that in but at least it gives you a life log of what that person is experiencing in pictures right so this is i thought another great tool that it's a little expensive i guess but if your companies can afford it nothing like that okay so that was using the mobile actively as a tool the other way of doing this is to use mobile passively right i was just having a conversation with somebody uh, some time back he was talking about data mining and i was talking about how when you use a mobile phone there's so much of information right location data who you have talked to where you have gone what you have seen on your on your uh, what you have browsed whether it's acceptable non acceptable you know whatever but there's so much of data that's available and uh, so as somebody was telling me this the other day saying that you know what's the what within google what's the most used feature of google so i thought so but apparently among the google engineers it's google logs the logs the logs that people have right of what site so apparently they rely uh, and i don't know because this is an unverified story but apparently they rely heavily on just looking at logs of what people have done to understand people to find we are all creatures of habit right everybody will have some or the other pattern and if you see google now it says oh is this home can i tag this as home can i tag this as work essentially they are looking for patterns right so the other way to do this a little advanced way maybe is to use the mobile phone as a resource right the third shift that's happening is this whole 60s 6 degrees of separation that shrinking everybody is becoming more connected i don't know if you can see i found out i'm connected to barack obama through like 3 degrees of separation i was like super thrilled <laughs> i blocked out the guys in between but yeah i am apparently connected to him by like 3 degrees of separation so that shrinking we are becoming a more connected world um there was a time when this whole man with a mission was like you know like i'm the sole hero but now that's becoming groups with a purpose then meet up groups everywhere so groups is becoming the unit of thinking it's not individuals anymore right so again i called it uh, social butterfly effect but what's happening is people are becoming more and more social and everybody is having these circles of influence which are expanding colliding so i meet somebody i met like five years back i had you on linkedin through you i find somebody else and so on and so forth so what's the effect this has groups shape identities very strongly groups shape values so if we are considering if i'm designing something for him i can't consider him in isolation i have to consider who are the people who are influencing him who are the people he can influence right so that becomes important we have to consider multiple perspectives if he's trying out my service today where his experience ends maybe his will begin because he'll come and tell him then you know what dude i tried this this was super awesome you've got to try it too so that's why we have to consider groups the other side of it is because there's so many groups around we have ready communities of practice that we can tap into i was doing a study for patient experience recently all i had to do was go online i found so many communities patient opinion you know uh, uh, patient matters and healthcare uh, entrepreneurs and there were so many people available just as groups and you don't have to go scouting like you know i want participants for my research if you get into one of these groups you'll find a group of people that you can tap into right okay so that pretty much covers discover so far everybody is with me okay great now I'll come to the fun part which is coming back in communicating so you found what is of value now you want to communicate that to your team okay so what's the classic standards to be how many of us still makes make reports for user research yeah 
pretty much reports, no, still, right? So, uh, okay, so this is one shift which is happening and again, I, I'm just stating things which are actually common sense, but, uh, so we are moving from words to visuals. Look at how many things we do in our everyday life which are purely visual. Instagram, medium, you know, nobody uh, writes on blogspot anymore. Everybody has moved to medium, right? There's a nice fancy picture, nice fancy title like how I taught my grandma marketing or why I stopped eating potatoes and beans and things like that. Five ways to, you know, all of that. And then there's Pinterest, Facebook, YouTube. So we are becoming a more visual culture. We're think literally thinking with our eyes, right? And again, we are wired to be visual beings. Uh, that's a known fact. So I think when, when, when we communicate it back to our team, we should make it visual. We should make it short, visual and interesting. As I'll show some examples of how I've uh, tried doing this at work. And uh, I mean, I've had some success. People are at least interested, you know, rather than saying that, oh, rules are research, report rakh lo, baad mein padh lenge, you know. So i found that it actually works. So this is something that I did. This was a, um, so I did a research on SAP. So I work at SAP. I did a research on SAP's implementation experience. Huge beast. So I came back and I put together this board game. It had, it had, you can't read it. It's too uh, small, but it was like a board game with different parts of the implementation experience. I used construction as an analogy and explained it to them, right? Uh, the other thing I used was bit strips, comics. You know, everybody is ready to read a three-page comic rather than reading a ten-page usability report, right? So I've used comics, works well. Uh, this is another thing, the study that I was talking about, patient experience. What I found is the most important thing out there was there were these moments, there were these little stories, right? Ultimately, user research is about stories. I mean, we get lost in this whole data and, you know, 10 out of seven, 17 people said this, but it's about stories. So I found these stories, uh, I mean, you can just go through them, but they were really powerful stories. Saying that, you know, I'm sitting with the doctor, he has a few minutes, I have many silly questions, how do I ask my questions, right? So all this became the stories that I wanted to take back. You know what I did? I made a desktop calendar. I printed it out. I went to Printo and I printed it like a calendar. You have these quarter day calendars, no? I don't know if you've seen. Every day you have a new quote, inspirational quote. I made this into a calendar. Each of them was color coded, categorized, and it was like a desktop calendar. And I gave out this desktop calendar to my team. And I just leave it on the desk, right? And live it, read those stories, and you'll realize what actually are the opportunity areas. You don't have to do a major session for it. So these are some ways that I have tried making it visual. This is another way that I found somebody else had done, which was to actually put it up. This was a design agency. They went back and put up like a pop-up studio inside their client's office. And all their research finding, they made posters, they made it like an exhibition that everybody could come and watch. And it's super interesting. And the second thing I think is important here is we come back and we communicate our findings to our team. But we don't go back to those people and communicate it to them. You know, we have a very transactive model of this. Right? You call somebody, you recruit a user research participant, do the research, compensate them, give them a little voucher and say thank you very much and that's it. Right? But what's happening is it's becoming more and more important to establish communities of practice. So if you find connections, go back to them, tell them, you know, this is what I found from the study. It's just going to keep them connected to you. Somebody was talking in the morning about having that relationship with users, right? So this is what it is. Then you go and communicate it back to them. And these dotted lines of feedback and influence, you're going to strengthen them and finally they'll come back to you, they'll feel more comfortable to you and you can tap into that uh, resource for getting more inputs. Okay? Uh, so far good? We'll move on? You'll be good on time? Okay. So next part is create. Uh, so what's happening here is, uh, when I say create, so what, what typically was the thing is user research, I have done it, it's your time to create. Right? User researcher gives input, designer creates or the developer creates. That was how it was thought to be no longer. Now the model is everybody works together, so it's equally our responsibility. Okay, sorry. <laughs> equally our responsibility as well to be a part of that messy creation process. So uh, the other shift that I've have seen happening in creation is we are moving from co-located specialists. Earlier there was like a user research team, a design team which was co-located sitting together. Now it's moving to multidisciplinary teams. 
obvious, right? Everybody knows that. And they are spreading out. Everybody knows 37 signals? Yeah? Spread out all over, right? They've even written a book on how to actually manage companies which are located in different locations. And collaborative creation. Everybody knows open IDO? Open IDO, yeah? Where they post a challenge and then people post solutions quirky. Everybody knows quirky. Quirky is similar, right? You can post an idea, somebody builds up on it, and then you post. So we are going towards collaborative creation. We are going towards spread out, geographically spread out uh, teams, and we are going towards multidisciplinary teams. So uh, we are moving from waterfalls to iterations. Again, a well-known fact, right? Everybody is talking agile. Everybody is talking iterations, and the waterfall mode is pretty much disappearing. What that means for us is because we are doing lots of iterations, because we are spreading out geographically, and because we are multidisciplinary teams who sometimes may seem like Greek Latin to each other, right? What's happening is, the, sometimes the value might get lost. Sometimes people as a team, in the whole thing about features and coordinations and meetings and iterations, you might forget why you were doing this in the first place. Many times you start a project, it takes three months, four months, and then people are like, Acha, hum sh kya chalo karna chalo? I hope everybody understands Hindi, sorry, I sort of go back into it. But sometimes people go like, oh, why did we start doing this in the first place? What were we trying to achieve? What was the need, right? So that's why it becomes more and more important for user researchers or UX professionals to hold on to that value. That's why our presence in that whole creation process is more and more important, right? How do we do that? I have found post, it's covered, I don't know, it's uh, pixelated for some reason, but anyways, doesn't matter. Uh, what I found is doing posters, it's a super, super valuable technique. I used a Wolverine poster here, but it's dead simple, right? Okay, 10 minutes to go, I'm pretty much done. The Wolverine poster is, uh, it's, it's dead simple, right? And if you can actually make a poster for your product or your service, and just stick it around so that everybody remembers what was the core need, Right? Even if it's a photograph that kind of sums up what you're trying to do, if it tells you, you know, what your product should be for, who it should be for, that's enough. So I found posters to be super effective. Just at the end of it, before you start creation, simple poster, non-threatening, right? It looks completely non-threatening. Just put it up and then people can remember this each time. The other thing I I wish I had time to show this, but I don't. Mm -hmm. So I'll skip a word, but I'm sure most of you have seen this. It's Twitter in plain English. Everybody seen this? Anybody? Okay, just go look up on Vimeo or YouTube. It's called Twitter in plain English. It basically explains what Twitter does using just cutouts and plain English, right? So uh, it doesn't talk about the product feature. It's just drawn out with paper and pen. And it's like a stop motion kind of a, a video which shows what Twitter is, right? So these kind of videos I found sometimes help. Now you do a video and leave it. So even if people are sitting, some a team is in China, a team is in India, a team is wherever, it's still easier. You can just send a video and say, you know, this is what we are trying to achieve, and that stays with people, right? So um, the other thing is I was talking about quirky. Is we are moving to collaborative creation. I was talking of open IDEO. So I found a really interesting example of how you can make this fun. Because if you're doing collaborative creation, right, I think it's very important to keep it fun for people. Otherwise, what's the what's the fun? Why do people go to open IDEO? Because you can you see such inspiring ideas from everybody, you see that something's being done to your idea. So I found this nice example. Has anybody played this game? It's a game called iWire. Okay, it's actually, it looks like a game, but what is, what you're actually doing is you're mapping real neurons. Okay, there are these uh, neurons that they wanted to map and it's huge, right? So what they decided to do is make a game out of it. And when you actually pay it, it's a game for you, but what you're actually doing is mapping neurons, right? So it's collaborative value creation that is made completely fun, right? Try thinking of that. If you have a problem that needs lot of people to work together, try and see if you can make it fun for them in some ways, right? So that's the create part of it, and the last part of it is assess. This is what assessment looks like, no? Usability testing, get somebody into a lab. I've done usability testing for maps, a very popular map service on the mobile phone. Do you know how we did it? 
we called people into the lab, gave them a mobile phone and made them nicely sit in a place and then try it out. Does it make sense? No. Why? Because when the guy is actually going to use maps, probably one hand is on the driving wheel, one hand is on the phone and then he's trying to make his way through some crazy Bangalore traffic, right? So it doesn't make sense to do assessment the traditional way, right? Um, then now I see a lot of people doing remote uh, user validation where you, your user can be across the uh, world and you can do remote usability testing. Helps because you're, it extends your reach, right? You don't need to travel someplace, you can get wider users. But this is a shift. Almost everything that we do now, we're moving from computers to mobiles, right? That brings, and I'm, I've still not found answers to this, is how do you see what they're seeing and doing? A large part of user research is not asking, but observation. How do we observe what somebody is doing on a phone? It's difficult. It's easy on the computer, right? If I tell you to sit in the computer and observe from here, it's okay. But if you're doing it on the phone and I come and see like this, it, nobody wants it. So I have not really found an answer to this because there's not yet a good, a, a very good way to do this. Largely, uh, there is there's software like Dscout, which people use, AskM, Dscout. There's some software that people use for doing mobile user research, but it's still self-reported. You know, you're asking people to report what they feel, what they see, and it's still not the best model, right? So that's, if you find something nice where people are actually doing this, please let me know, I'd be happy. The other shift that's happening is we are moving from usability to user experience. So how do you test an experience? Usability is, fed, is dead simple to test. How do you test an experience? It's spread across time, it's spread across people, it's spread across spaces, and there's so many moving parts that sometimes, how do you test the whole experience, right? Another question where I still have not found convincing answers. If you found interesting models of somebody testing experience, do let me know. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to share this. This is something that I found again on Quirky, is how people are doing crowdsource, crowdsourcing validation and uh, assessment. So there was this thing, if I had an idea, you know, uh, oh, what will people say and, you know, uh, I don't want to really expose it or get feedback on it. But I see a lot of people are now, and I think this is largely because of the entrepreneurship culture that's coming up. I don't know, or it's because of this whole open connected thing uh, that's happening. But people are actually crowdsourcing things. So if you have a product or a service that you want to test, why not try and see if you can crowdsource it in some way? Try and put feelers into a coffee area. You might get some responses, right? So, I mean, what I mean is people are directly doing this, right? You're hacking it. People are prototyping things. People are, uh, it's not a, a typo. It's not meant to be a prototype. It's meant to be prototype. Uh, there is this uh, small booklet called Prototyping Manifesto by this guy called Albert Savoya. Uh, go read it. It's super interesting. It talks of how a prototype and a prototype is slightly different, right? And how are the ways you can hack things, literally. So, do it the lean way. Uh, that's the major change I see in companies. Company, big companies are also starting to think like entrepreneurs. And I'll give an example. Yeah, so this is the patient experience research that we were doing. So we wanted to get stories from people. Remember the stories I showed you? They came after a lot, lot of tries. We tried everything. We tried uh, leaving little like feeders on people's desks in office. We made a Tumblr site, we made a Facebook site, we called people up, we tried our own networks just to get people's stories. So the point is that we have to be flexible. It's not uh, like earlier that you have a research plan and for six months and you have a research budget which you still will need to have. But the point is that I think we need to be more flexible, try a more mixed media approach because people are nowadays, attention span is so less, so we need to be constantly you know, trying out new stuff, iterative research approach. We iterate while we are building, why not iterative, iterate when we are doing research, right? Not, uh, not like research in different stages, but within the same stage also, try and iterate your research methods, you might find something different. And before they shut it off, I'll come to the last slide, am I going back, okay, is be creative and be exciting in how you approach this whole thing. And I think, yeah, if we do that, if you make it fun, the discover, everybody remembers, just checking, discover, then 
Communicate, then create and ask assess. Yay, good. Lovely is okay. So I think we do that, be creative, be exciting and be able to do user research differently and um, please share it back whenever we meet or we stay in touch. I'd be super happy to know. Yeah? Thank you. Anybody has any questions? We have time for questions? No. <coughs> Yeah, not a question, but just to add on to your mobile part. It actually a couple of apps launched in last month uh, okay. where it actually records the voice screen? experience the person is having. Both the screen as well as the camera. They can choose front camera or the... Right, what's it called? Camera. We have been... I'll, I'll drop a... Sure. A so, uh, by the way, that reminded me, uh, IDEO published, uh, just four or five days back I found it. Uh, RDO, uh, just go look up research uh, in digital world. User research in digital world or design research in digital world. It's an article by IDEO and they talk of the different tools that you can actually use on like Ethneo and all of those tools, right? So they talk of the different tools that you can use for doing mobile research or remote user uh, user research and all of that. It's an IDEO article. If anybody is interested, look it up. There's yeah. a bunch of tools there. Just to add that, there's yeah. a site called remoteresearch.com. Yeah, you that remote say, research has. Look, you'll have all the tools that are. Correct. Remoteresearch.com is another site where you can find a whole bunch of tools that you can use for doing remote research. And uh, IDEO's uh, article has some bunch of other interesting tools as well.